We're going to make the best of them. Put your seatbelts on, folks, because we're going to move. Uh, tonight, I want to tell you about a couple storms. Uh, we are facing um, we are facing a couple of huge threats. And the threat comes from international law, and specifically the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And it comes from an American judiciary that no longer is willing to follow the rule of law, that is no longer to recognize uh, the rule of law for what it is. When I put that robe on, and I put my hand on the Bible, and I put my other hand up, and I promised and swore and affirmed to uphold the Constitution of the United States, the last three words I said were, so help me God. Amen. And the reason that an office holder in this nation does that is to remind them that as they are being given the sword of power, the privilege of the sword of power, they are to wield it and hold it only with the understanding that there is a higher power and that they too are under God. How many of you are parents? Raise your hand for me. God bless you. When you took that little one home for the first time and he or she was in your arms, did you need a Supreme Court opinion or a government statute or a constitutional provision to tell you that it was your responsibility and duty and responsibility to raise that child? and control and direct the upbringing of that child and the education of that child and the choice and to make choices for that child. No, you didn't. Every nation in this country, except for the United States, has signed a treaty that signs that right away and shifts it to the government. President Clinton, under that administration, signed this treaty called the Convention of the Rights of the Child. He didn't have the votes in the Senate, and no president since then, for good reason, has sent that treaty to the Senate for ratification. Now, Mrs. Clinton, first lady at the time, is now the Secretary of State. She was instrumental in the drafting of that treaty. It is high on their priority. It is high on the priority of the uh, Senate leadership at this time. We're going to talk a little bit about what that treaty does in a little bit. This nation, with regard to federalism, with regard to where your protections are, whether it should be state law or whether there should be a federal child protective worker knocking on your door. It will fundamentally change the, the scope and the understanding of every law and protection that parents have had with regard to the understanding that is child, uh, that a parent is best equipped to make decisions for the child rather than some government bureaucrat. Now, our nation, we understood that even before we were a nation, long before our nation. Uh, the divine law told us that it was a parent's responsibility to raise their child, to raise a child up. It was um, a parent's responsibility to educate a child or to make decisions with regard to what was in the best interest of the child, to control and direct the upbringing of the child and the education of the child. And the natural law thinkers that followed and that came to this nation, of which our founders read, all articulated what the common law reflected, and that also reflected the divine law, which was it is a parent, not the government, that controls and directs the upbringing of the child because they're best equipped to do so. Now, because we had a different worldview when our nation started, we had something called the Declaration of Independence that we all understand. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all are created equal, endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable liberties. One of those inalienable, inalienable means sacred, unchanging liberties, was always known by our founders to include a parent's right and duty and responsibility to control and direct the upbringing of their child. Now, the Supreme Court of these United States, when we had such a worldview, when we looked at law through the prism of uh, the divine, 
that there were some unchanging liberties that we could always look to to decide whether or not a law passed by folks that live in this building here in this Congress. That we could always take one of their laws and we could always measure it against these liberties to see whether it was good or bad, right or wrong, just or unjust. And so the free exercise of religious conscience, the freedom of speech, and yes, the fundamental right of a parent to control and direct the upbringing of their child was always, from the beginning of this nation's history, considered one of those sacred, inalienable liberties. And so let me give you an example of what happened one time. Uh, the state of Oregon, surprise, surprise. People's Republic of Portland, I'm sorry. but Wonderful, wonderful place out there, but man, it's out there on that left coast. Um, they decided that, you know what, maybe we ought to change the world here. Maybe we ought to not see law and liberty as coming from God. Maybe we ought to, you know, maybe we ought to think that we can do it ourselves better. And so they passed a law that said, you know, parents don't dare homeschool your child. Don't dare send your child to a private school. Don't dare send your child to a religious school. You must send your child to our government school.